My name is Jelena Stosic and I'm the Strategy Director at Kids Industries. First of all, thank you very much for being here today on this online research session for the Children's Media Conference. Uh, Children's Media Conference normally takes place face to face in Sheffield, so this is a new way for us to be. However, I'm hopeful and certain even uh, that we will be able to get just as much sharing, inspiration, uh, discussion of interesting insights done. So I'm very grateful to you for being here uh, and very glad myself to be able to share some recent research work with you. Our theme for today uh, looks at children's spending in gaming. The good, the bad and the ugly of how kids spend within what is arguably their most important category of engagement. It's perhaps a little bit controversial even because, because our audience is young, you know, and it feels uncomfortable sometimes to speak of their spend, to speak of monetizing their engagement. At the same time, avoidance of that theme and topic uh, doesn't help in understanding it, doesn't help in creating ethically, creating well, uh, and ultimately doesn't help with regulating that space. So we do think it is an important theme for us to discuss. The research project was done in collaboration with KBMB in Germany. KBMB are a Germany-focused, uh, Germany-based rather than focused actually, a Germany-based uh, full-service agency and I would like to take this opportunity to thank them for their insights and for their support in analyzing this. We chose gaming, uh, I mean arguably how couldn't we choose gaming? It's the biggest entertainment industry by far. It outstrips music and it outstrips uh, films significantly and it keeps growing. It was estimated that in 1995 there were a hundred million gamers in the world, whereas these days it's more like 3 billion and moving away from console into gaming on all kinds of devices. Uh, kids in every research session will touch upon gaming as an important part of their life. It's uh, the brand extension that they would most like to see and the engagement method that they would really like you to focus on. So in a way, looking at the growth that gaming is exhibiting, looking at all those billions of uh, globally predicted revenue, we do need to acknowledge that a significant proportion of those billions are children. And that's where things get complex because we then need to acknowledge that it's a space that isn't always obvious to them in terms of how to navigate it. Most of newspapers cl clippings will be negative. Uh, almost always there's talks of kids feeling, uh, well, children uh, spending in games and their parents feeling that it is close to gambling, uh, the loot boxes, the bills that they didn't know how to navigate. It's almost like a danger zone and I think some of the clippings probably do illustrate that. But at the same time, speaking to children regularly, we do we must notice that for them, it's a space of joy more than anything else. And 69% of children in our study believe that being able to spend in a video game makes that game more enjoyable. Arguably, being able to spend on a holiday makes it more enjoyable. So that isn't a huge surprise, but it is almost a call for us to make sure that we, rather than pretending it's not happening, uh, do the research and do the groundwork that we need to do in order to do it ethically, do it delightfully and do it well. Uh, so that's why we chose that as a topic and today the data that we will be sharing will be predominantly quantitative data with some qual elements. Over the next few weeks we'll be adding uh, multiple other territories as well as uh, multiple uh, other qual immersions. So feel free to get in touch for any more data and info around children's perception of this space as well as more broadly value uh, and spending. So what do children spend money on and how much money do they have anyway? Uh, broadly speaking, children in both UK and Germany, most of them receive pocket money. It's around eight pounds a week. And we've asked them and their parents, what are they most likely to spend it on? Just to understand where digital lies and how it compares to physical spending. And at the youngest age, sort of the six to eight year old group that we studied, the findings are not surprising. Toys, uh, especially in the UK, retain their siren call and children are actually very likely to spend their money on toys and on snacks and sweets. However, gaming, uh, video, video gaming sort of on console and PC comes in very significantly third with 32% of children being likely to often spend their money there. And then as children get older, uh, it's almost like the 
the toys and the gaming spend reverse fully and for the 12 to 14 year olds uh, the most important category of expenditure uh, of the money that they do have is within gaming. So quite a significant shift and just a highlight of how important it is that we understand this space that effectively seems to dominate their wallet. There's two other important trends that I would like to highlight on this slide. One is about the difference between the spend in console and PC games versus mobile games. So on this slide the, the larger numbers if you like are the PC and console, whereas the smaller numbers are for a mobile phone. We think that's because the most recent prime gaming examples uh, have been uh, the Fortnite, Fortnite of this world and Roblox and Minecraft. Still to this day that's where children spend the most and these, even though they exist on mobile, started a, their life cycle either on a PC or a console and as such still, still retain a part of that. Looking at broader gaming trends uh, we do expect this to reverse uh, and mobile gaming to edge closer and ultimately surpass uh, the console and PC spend. And then the second trend is the kids in Germany just seem generally less spendy, don't they? Uh, gaming actually retains its position as a hugely important category of how a child might distribute their, their pocket money and the money that they receive on other occasions. However, broadly speaking, they do spend less. We think that's uh, due to some cultural differences, but also the the setup of where children uh, shop, where they go out and what they end up spending their own money on versus what their parents buy us. We also noticed another important pattern. Uh, so children, as they get older, are more likely to spend within gaming. However, they actually spend less. I was almost surprised by this uh, as they do actually have more money as they grow older. But having spoken to the children sort of in qualitative sessions, having dug under the skin of it a bit more, it absolutely makes perfect sense. An older child has a way bigger sphere of experience. They have so many things that they can get on with. They have much more physical freedom uh, when they're not in lockdown of moving around and going out with friends and spending on fashion. And in a way, even though a, their, their wallet is bigger and B, they are more likely to spend in gaming. The actual relative, uh, relative expenditure does change, so they do end up spending less. So that's something that might be interesting keeping in mind, just as you think of your target audience and what else they have going on in their life in addition to the game. We then looked at, are there any important differences in motivation and engagement within games? either based on the type of gamer or the type of game. Uh, looking at gamer types and looking at gamer motivation. And it actually turns out that children are way more complex gamers than perhaps one would have anticipated. So the myth effectively of a dominant gamer type and of a single person always making same choices or behaving consistently is not very likely with children and perhaps that is the case because they're still developing and growing the personalities and experimenting to some degree with, with what they want to do. But an average child within our study had 2.69 motivations per game. So in a way, rather than having being driven by only one reason or one goal, they were blending them and they were uh, they were developing a synthesis of what they're looking for and what brings them joy within particular genres, whether that's free joy of playing that game or a joy that they need to pay for. So rather than being able to categorize them into very specific gamer types, what we ended up doing is looking at different genres and trends and patterns that we observed within them. So I'll tell you about the four main genres the children play within. Uh, as those are the lenses we looked at were the games they play most often and most recently, their genres, their motivations and their spend and how all of these tell a story. So we open with action. Not surprisingly, the most popular genre within our relatively broad research and children categorize uh, Fortnite, Apex Legends, Clash Royale, Call of Duty, all for them are firmly within the category of action. In other words, you could say that all the games that they are technically a bit too young to play are firmly within the category of action. Action games were the ones that had the, the highest conversion rate uh, and uh, around over 60% of children who 
particularly delighted in playing action games over the last period made in-app purchases or in-game purchases within this category. But what was most surprising, interesting, not unexpected, but great to see it in the data, was that the number one motivation, number one goal the children have when playing action games, beyond fun, which sort of stays consistent, wasn't defeating people and it wasn't leveling up and it wasn't collecting things or winning. It was socialising. And that's something we've been seeing a lot in the qual studies and having children report that by and large they play Fortnite in party mode and that they use it to speak to their friends. But it was really interesting seeing it uh, so strongly reflected in the data. It fit, this fits very nicely with the work done by Dr. Richard Bartle looking at gamer types. It's one of the seminal pieces of work within this category, uh, category of study and he analysed a whole bunch of gamers looking at what are some of their primary motivations and he argued that socialisers are the most frequent gamers, that 80% of gamers effectively are socialisers and that fits in very nicely with, with our findings too. Uh, important to note, socialising isn't genre dependent. So even though Fortnite was the game children were, were most likely to find very social, it happened within FIFA, it happened within Call of Duty. So all around they were delighting in interactions, they were feeling rewarded by being able to share the experience with, with other people, uh, they were enjoying uh, common experiences and chat rooms were available and all the innovations and the ways in which it is possible to socialise today. I'd say that over the past few months a lot of parents have had a very informative experience of the role of gaming within a child's social life and social sphere as it was almost not hidden from, from sight previously just how important they are to a child's social standing to a child's social engagement but now that everyone's been stuck at home more we've heard many reports of Almost a new understanding of parents that, for most kids, action games are not much more than a playground. And with the in-game concerts and in-game cinema, this is something that we expect to be only increasing from now on. Something else that is interesting to note here, uh, if you are designing games and thinking of how best to leverage the socialiser motivation, it starts growing very significantly as kids get older. So sort of four, five, six, it's there but it's way less significant and sort of once you hit 9, 10, 11, 12 uh, it becomes one of the most delightful ways in which they can game. And going from there to something very different, sandbox games. Again a very popular type largely due to Minecraft and uh, Roblox which are the games children are most likely to categorize over here. They, they're less likely to be encouraging or inviting uh, purchases, perhaps because of the way in which they are less likely to encourage socialization. Even though they, they can and they do, they are designed for it, it appears that children are finding a bit less joy in socializing within sandbo sand sandbox games and that they're using them primarily to, to explore the world and sort of engage with what is around them. Uh, they're very flexible gaming formats, so they certainly do allow that. Very much middle of the ground in terms of how they monetize, but very much satisfying for the explorers, uh, which is also an important gaming motivation. And from there to something very different again, which are the platform games. So for our children, for the children in the study, the platform games were those endless runners and uh, sort of relatively easy, repetitive, multi-level games that were categorized as platforms and these were interesting as they appealed primarily to those children that are achievers. So the ones that delight in winning and getting the levels and completing the game and sort of just getting to that next stage. So quite a different motivation and mindset compared to the exploring of the, of the sandbox games as well as compared to the socializing of the action games. Never thought I'd say that, but I like it. Uh, in the platform games we get the achievers and we identified two separate ways in which children of different ages achieve, where the slightly younger group, sort of six, seven, eight, is more likely to be driven by what you could call the external achievement and the 
levels and being the best and the charts showing your stats and uh, getting all the rewards, unlocking the trophies, whereas as children get older and sort of into the nine-year-olds and further, this achiever tended to be a bit more around challenging yourself. Uh, there are interesting nuances just in terms of game design as how you present results, how you design for progress, will differ significantly based on whether the children are to be motivated by a challenge and by themselves or by next level. Uh, these games are middle of the ground as well in terms of monetizing. However, I th we do believe that this is because the range of, of offer is actually really wide. They are technically designed uh, to be very good at offering you something for the next level. However, they do require a superb gamification engine that will actually uh, create a uniquely engaging experience for those that engage for free and those that do not uh, and a, a great ecosystem for them. So where they do succeed, they can be very powerful and very satisfactory for all parties involved. And then finally, the, the game genre I called the deceivingly free, the puzzles. So the puzzles are the most likely to be a free download. Almost 70% of puzzle downloads are free uh, within our study. They're also the least likely to, to convert to someone paying for an in-game purchase. But once people do convert, they're likely to spend the most. Uh, and I think that's partly due to genre affinity, partly due to the way that they are designed. However, they are very much in the deceivingly free category. Once again, they appeal to achievers and they were not one of the most popular genres, but they do find uh, their category of engager with the achievers and can serve very well over there. We wanted to know what children buy and how does that differ by genre and what are the what are some of the trends and observations we could learn from there and interestingly the number one thing the children buy seems to be power and reputation but they buy it in two ways so first of all they buy it through currency across all game genres the most the most frequently purchased type of game purchase, game engagement, tends to be the currency. And 41% of kids have, that have made a purchase did so with, in this way. And I do believe that this is them buying power and agency. Because interestingly, in the study, we also asked them if they could choose between a physical gift and a digital gift and cash, sort of cold hard cash. As children get older, cash tends to be the most likely item to be chosen. And that doesn't seem to be a judgment on physical or on digital. It just seems to be a desire for them to make their own decision and for them to exercise their own agency. And we interpret the game spending on currency to be very similar and in a way to represent children buying, buying power, buying the way to make their game better however they choose. And then the second uh, most engaging category within which children bought were items for their character. Ultimately, if it's a party, if it's a playground, how you show up matters. Often these items are cosmetic, not always even delivering on a on a gameplay feature, but delivering on a game enjoyment feature. This is also confirmed looking at why children buy, where making their character better and customizing their character uh, are the dominant reasons. Uh, in many respects, and to the parents in the study, that wasn't a concern, as it was still seen a rationale, a child's rationale that's focused on their enjoy enjoyment and their pleasure. Uh, what they didn't appreciate as much and what was a cause of concern was a relatively high number of children choosing to buy within a game because their friends are doing it or because people they like on the internet are doing it. This is the area that's likely to cause great dissatisfaction and where uh, regulation in some respects is needed uh, and where education and game design needs to assist and support as well. So what are the good news all around? Well, the data does indicate that we are we're slowly getting the hang of it between the industry, the parents and the children navigating this ecosystem. So we asked in our study what have people ever, have children ever made and then a game purchase by accident. And whilst this number is not zero, which is the ambition, at 18% is sort of the most for ever and a long period of time, it's probably not the it happens to everyone 
all the time uh, pattern that we are seeing uh, around the world and like in the press. Uh, what is also interesting are the ways in which parents are navigating this space. Most of the times children participate in in the buying of anything they may want within the game and in fact in 36 percent of families children need to pay for most or for all of their in-game purchases and interestingly that's a route that many parents and our research have taken is is using these kind of in-game purchases as a way to teach children about economics and the value of money ultimately if you want it buy it so it's your money so you can do with it whatever you like Interestingly as well, 94% of children need to proactively ask for permission when they're buying something within a game. Now, it's worth remembering that our sample had children up to the age of 14, so this does include those relatively older children, which quite possibly have a lot of things that they are allowed to buy without proactively asking, but it does seem that parents are trying to navigate the space with a bit more, with a bit more safety and with a bit more consideration. I mean, in some respects, any physical purchase would involve a seller regulating it and choosing what's appropriate for you or not, or at least to a degree doing that. Whereas in the digital world, that is harder to navigate, so parents are asking their children to always ask for permission. Even though it's a work in progress area and one of, uh, of a lot of turbulence and a lot of negotiation, parents can see the benefits as well as they can see many challenges. So one of the areas of study has been what is wrong with game spending. Uh, this covers all the game spending but most often it does tend to be within the realm of in-game purchases where people have a lack of understanding or a challenge. They know even less about subscription. And also asking them what's good about it. So some of the main things that can be bad about it is uh, a pet peeve is going in twice so having a game that someone paid for and then charging more on top of it is seen as a no-no as and as something that is poor experience on top of that uh, ux which leads to accidental purchases should be avoided at all costs as well as anything that causes envy amongst children or somehow prevents the game from happening unless you buy. In many respects the game designers within the audience would probably be thinking we do, that's one of the very important elements of designing a game or designing a game well is that you can progress without having to buy but when designing for children it's particularly important. Of course some parents just see any game purchases as pretend things and that is probably the hardest attitude to shift uh, compared to the other ones which are resolvable problems. And then on the good side of things, there are ways to optimize or to make an in-game experience or a purchase better. They are things like providing real value. Uh, and value can mean many different things, but for most parents it's around seeing them, seeing the children having a joy, joyful experience in that game. It also revolves around selling a complete experience as a game. If a game is perceived as a quality product, it's more likely to be seen as something worth paying for. I think there has been some bad experiences with branded games coming out before they're ready or not quite perfect or with some errors and they are the more likely ones to cause disappointment. On top of it, uh, the good sides are the economics education as mentioned where they do reinforce a positive behavior uh, as well as the opportunity to customize a game to the child. So if I were to summarize what is effectively a pretty rich data set and into, into an area that is exciting and, and growing, uh, I'd say that there are a couple of optimizers and a couple of key consideration areas that we need to keep in our mind. Primarily we need to always keep in the mind the gamer and the game, the motivations, uh, what is the ultimate cause of joy and delight within our game and work within that. Uh, I think looking at some of those charts that show the genres, that show the audience, will be a great starting point, but you know the best what is the motivation for your game that you're working on. It's okay and it's in some respects encouraged looking at how children consume games to create for multiple motivations and layer them, but what we definitely shouldn't do if we are to create in a more ethical way, which we certainly should, is layer multiple monetization models one on top of the other as that is likely to cause just annoyance and further confusion within this space. 
some of the other things we need to focus on is to create as if the parents are watching because remember 94% of kids need to proactively ask for an in-game purchase but at the same time design so as if they're not and design for, for the fact that accidental purchases really have absolutely no place to play within children's gaming. We also need to do away with anything that encourages envy or anything that prevents game success from happening without paying for it uh, and ultimately that should take us all into into a path of more ethical, more delightful uh, games for all parties involved, be that parents, children or industry. This is a really important focus area for us alongside looking at generally children and families perception of value, of spending, of uh, different decision-making patterns within different industries. Uh, so if you have any questions and if you'd like to discuss this any further, by all means, get in touch. Our contact details should be on the screen. Thank you very, very much and see you soon.